think that we can start. Good afternoon to everybody. We are, uh, I would like to take the opportunity and thank uh, Tarek for putting things together for such a terrific event. Also, I would like to uh, thank him for giving me a 10 minute presentation for discussing about complications. You know, it's my favorite topic, complications. It, they always happen in another institution, never to our institution. So these are my uh, disclosures. I don't think that uh, will affect in any way my presentation to you today. And I'm coming from Larissa. Larissa is in the center of the Greek uh, mainland, approximately 350 kilometers north of Athens, 150 kilometers south of Thessaloniki. It's an academic town. It has a, a busy tertiary trauma service. And what I'm, I'll try to do within the next uh, eight, 10 minutes or so is to briefly describe the role of decompression craniectomy in the contemporary era. Also try to identify and uh, give you an idea about the actual incidence of the procedure associated complications. Try to attempt to identify any predisposing factors, <clears throat> excuse me, for developing these complications. And also finally to give you some tips and tricks if I can about mitigating uh, the incidence of these complications. You know, when we discuss and we have done that a lot during the last two, three days about decompression craniectomy. We are discussing about a single procedure, although we perform several different surgical techniques and we collectively term them as decompressive craniectomies. So there is definitely some kind of variation between different uh, techniques of decompressive craniectomy. However, the common ground among all, among all these techniques is the opening of the box so although there are two uh, randomized clinical trials dedicated to the role, the clinical significance of decompressive craniectomy, and I'm referring to the DECRA study and the rescue ICP study, there are still several questions that are seeking for an answer. There are still several controversial topics associated with the employment of decompressive craniectomy. And I think that uh, in an effort to just minimize these controversial areas and try to give some answers to that, is, was that uh, consensus uh, meeting that we had almost two years ago in uh, Cambridge in the UK. And we came up with uh, some guidelines regarding the surgical technique, the indications, and potentially the clinical role of decompressive uh, craniectomy. So what are the complications associated with this procedure? You may see them there. We may have uh, hemorrhagic the incidence of new novel hemorrhagic contusions or the uh, evolution of uh, pre-decompressive craniectomy contusions. There are also expansion of contralateral or ipsilateral hematomas. There are encephalocils that are associated with that. There are herniation syndromes, ischemia, which may be associated with that uh, herniation. Also a really controversial topic, that of ventriculomegaly or hydrocephalus after a decompressive mm -hmm. craniectomy. The incidence of various yes, infections yeah. from surgical wounds, superficial infections, all the way to mm. uh, meningitis or encephalitis and ventriculitis, and also the non trifine syndrome. So uh, we need to take yeah. into consideration also when we are dealing with patients uh, undergoing decompressive craniectomy that the procedure is associated with a complication of the second procedure, the accompanying procedure, that of the cranioplasty, and we need to take that into consideration. Okay. So they made my work really uh, easy. These guys, when we, they published a really good systematic meta-analysis, and that was done in 2015, they included 142 previously uh, published reports regarding the outcome and the incidence of complications associated with decompressive craniectomy. And actually, you can see that they have done a terrific job. They categorized that in three major categories, hemorrhagic complications, infectious uh, associated complications and also hydrodynamic complications. And you can see that when we talk about hydrodynamic complications, we refer mostly to the incidence of subdural or interhemispheric hygroma, and also the incidence of ventriculomegaly or hydrocephalus. The definition is highly controversial as you uh, know quite well. So you can see the numbers there. There is no reason for me to just read these numbers for you. You can see that uh, there are pretty significant incidence of infections, anywhere from 6% to 8%. Uh, 
the incidence of ipsilateral hematoma is approximately 13%, and the contusion enlargement or evolution is somewhere around 12%. You can see the numbers in the parentheses are the numbers that are referred to pediatric series. Uh, they are, everything else is uh, referring to adult population. After that uh, meta-analysis in 2015, there was a couple of years after that, another single institution prospective study, which actually they reported complication rate, a cumulative complication rate, quite high, 90%, as you may see. The most common complication occurred in their series was the formation of some kind of brain herniation, which affected approximately one third of their patients. And uh, also all the other complications that had been previously described in the literature, you can see the numbers there. I do have some kind of, uh, uh, I'm somewhat reluctant to adapt these numbers because these are quite high. And I think that the cumulative complication is extremely high. I don't know all the details. I, it was a prospective study, but it was a single center experience. So we need to keep that in mind. And finally, the most recently published uh, series this is the one that was, it was a retrospective, single center, and you can see again the numbers that are proximal to the numbers that uh, had been summated by the guys who presented their meta-analysis. So uh, it seems that the cranioplasty related complications need to be taken into consideration because it's the other side of the coin, the same coin. So there is significant variation in the cranioplasty complications too. And I know that one of my collaborators is going to cover that topic later on today. Anywhere, significant variation anywhere from 11 to 36%, depending on the center, the uh, population, and uh, anything else that uh, you can see there. So what about tips and tricks for avoiding some kind of complication associated with decompression craniectomy? First of all, we see that there is pretty significant incidence of hemorrhagic or hemorrhagic related complications, evolution of contusions or new hematomas ipsilateral or contralateral. So we need to make sure that we do have a really good normal clotting profile in these patients. We don't want to activate some kind of mechanism that uh, will induce disseminating intravascular coagulation. Also, the size of the craniectomy plays a significant role. So the skin incision also too. We don't want to have a skin incision which is smaller than the actual craniotomy, so the craniectomy so will not have any friction points uh, for the underlying uh, brain parenchyma. Also, whenever we perform a duraplasty, we know that we minimize the incidence of post-operative uh, high groma formation. And when I'm talking about duraplasty, there is, this is a really controversial topic about performing that or not, but even some kind of lay on dura there to cover the brain surface or any other kind of substance if this is not artificial dura. Also, the size of the craniectomy, I think it needs to be adequate. So we'll decompress the floor of the middle cranial fossa where most of the uh, pressure is. And uh, finally, you need to just keep in mind that the more you know about these complications, the higher is the possibility to prevent those and the higher is the possibility to early diagnose them and properly treat them. So with no further delay, I would like to thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>